Can you hi? Good to see them. Hi. Yeah, it's just uh, it's just Claire and I. It's awfully quiet in here. How many people are with you? Just your three, you and your sister? Me and my sister. This is my sister Margaret. Hi, Margaret. Hi, Hi sister. I'm Claire. Hello. I'm working on a Christmas stocking. It's um it's all um I'm 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 sewing on the sequence. It's uh -huh. um so it's sequins, it's embroidery, it's applique, and um, it's all it's all on felt. So um, my uh, my niece is expecting a baby in October, so I did one for the baby. And Joyce, I'll bring the stocking next week. I just have you know little you know pieces to put together. So I'll bring it next week so you can actually see a stocking that I finished. But um, I'm gonna be going to New York in another, in two weeks, two, two and a half weeks with the baby shower. So I wanna try to get as much done for the boyfriend's stocking. I've done them for all of my nieces and nephews and for all of their kids. So, um, I don't know. They, okay. I guess they kind of expected or or whatever. So, but it'll be a surprise. It'll be a surprise for them. But I still have to buy a gift because a stocking is is a given. So, Joyce, this is this is the latest stocking that I'm going to be working on. It's a snow snowman on a uh, snowboard. So, and it's and it's and it's hard to pick. Um, the stockings because a lot of them are kind of kiddish but at least with this snowman it is snowboarding it's it, it, you know it's it fits in an adult okay. so yeah but yeah very very cute uh, uh, all right so margaret has brought a wealth of things to share with us so i think i'm going to have her go ahead and start i'm going to turn on the other camera so okay. um do you want to start here or do you want to start well, we can out start here. there? All right. Because what big pieces are going to be better on the other camera? Oh. Okay. Well, then let's start with some smaller pieces. Okay. Um, things I've been working on more recently because I've been doing a lot of hand work as opposed to down on my sewing machine are things with embroidery. Wow. So it's just are, regular embroidery. And this are these, particular are these, are these for you or you give them as gifts or yeah. Uh, this is probably for me at this point and probably for whoever wants it later. <laughs> <laughs> it's not for anybody in particular, but it's like just a dresser scarf. So it's mm -hmm. it's a long rectangle. Very nice. And then I've been doing a lot of what they call hard anger work where you work on the 22 count Ada fabric. And this is a piece that's in progress. I've been working on this one for just a couple oh. of weeks. And you cut out the different parts like these. This corner has not been cut. This corner has been cut and, and worked the bars. So it's all going to look like this. But I have these last two little sections and this corner yet to do, and then it'll be done. And then the whole outside edge will be cut away and the zigzag dark blue that you see now will mm -hmm. be the edge when it's complete. Kind of like this one. I have to look at it and find the right side. This one is, has already been cut. So you can see the jagged edge. Mm -hmm. I can. But look so it's just kind of a just this is just a little square like the middle of a table piece you know just just fun and then i have a bunch of different ones that i've done this one is big and open so ada cloth is a, a linen that's woven very carefully so that it is perfectly square it's almost like needlepoint canvas but uh -huh. you don't have to 
background. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then this is a, a long one that's the same thing. And it just goes on forever and ever and ever. <laughs> but I have a long dresser, and so this will be able to go on the top of my dresser. So, Margaret, show me the. Uh, I will go ahead and show it to you. And then wow. this is a nice. So, some of them have hemmed edges, it's just a double turned hem. And then some of them have the. The, the, the lacy, edge. yeah, I see. I see. I saw that you had some, you know, more of a lacy, uh, you know, edge to it. So is this something that you learned from your mother and your grandmother or is the, well, how, how, did, how did you, how did you get into it or pick it up? Or? We come from a very long line of incredible needle workers. And I, I think I inherited a lot of my skills from them. My mom taught us the basics. And then mom was the first one to say, and she took them and ran with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because there are a lot of these things that mom never did, but I couldn't do without having learned the basics. And right. uh, the things that I do, I feel I could never have learned in a lifetime if I hadn't come from a long line of needle workers. Well, mm -hmm. I over the back of this embroidery piece, because this is one of the things that she and I were taught from very young age. So here's okay, the yes, front. This is the front. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the back. Okay. <laughs> this one. This is this is the front. Mm -hmm. And this is the back. That's amazing. It, it is. The only way you can tell these apart is there's this stitch and this stitch. You can tell on the front and the back they're slightly different mm -hmm. because the threads carry. But we were taught that the backs made a difference and they do make a difference in how your front looks. I have um, of those needlepoint rugs show yeah. up the backs really well. They're on the kitchen table. Okay, I'll go get them. But this is another one of the hard anger wow. pieces. Oh, this one it's going to be a wall hanging. No. That's why it's got these wooden ends. But I didn't want how it wherever it was to shadow through the holes, and so I backed it with light blue. Mm. So regardless <laughs> of where you, it's going to shadow through light blue in the holes of the dark blue. So you can do that depending on what you're going to do, as opposed to these others that I'll let the wood grain show through. Mm -hmm. But it's so another one of those. How do you cut out? How do you cut out the holes? The little pair of scissors. I, I don't know. You cut four. I don't know how to use my, I don't know how to use my computer. And, um, I don't know how to use my iPad. Really. It's pretty intricate, but it's a lot of fun. So, so do you, I, you cut it out. Right Go ahead. I'm sorry. You cut it out before you stitch it? You cut it out after you do the main, like um, this one I'm, that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. I'm, I cut these pieces out. Yeah, where's, the where's, where's, the, where's the volume? Uh, work, all, everything is worked mm -hmm. like this. And then I'll come in and I'll cut out and then I'll work it with the little crossbars like this. Wow. So I do all of the main stitching first before I cut it out. Otherwise, where you cut you out, it's going to warp too much before you work it. So you don't mm -hmm. want to cut it out too much before you're actually ready Isn't to work it. Got it. Interesting. So wow. this, this last corner has not been cut and it will end up being cut like all the rest of the corners. And, mm -hmm. and here we cut it but not stitched it yet. You can see how the threads of the fabric. It does have the fabric threads. The little bars on. Hmm. Yeah. Well, on herself, it's amazing. <laughs> it's fun, but it, it's time consuming, but it's fun. Well, so I have another question. Do you 
to make your the back look so complete are you, you constantly cutting and knotting no you run your threads under on that particular piece there are no knots at all so you anchor it's your thread own. and on like needlepoint my grandmother if i showed this to my grandmother she would say oh that looks lovely let's see how it yeah. really looks and she'd flip yeah. it over and look yeah. So um, let, let me just remind everybody that when you make a noise, the system says, oh, she's talking. I need to put her on the on the video. So you take over the video as well as the audio. So if, I'll, if I'll, you're. I'll yeah. yeah, that's better. Thanks. So now we can see Margaret's pictures. OK, go ahead. So one of the things that really shows that these are like little dollhouse rugs. And this is the front, and this is the back. And I had a girl in my uh, dollhouse miniatures group bring a piece the other day, and it looked lovely on the front, mostly. And uh, having been taught by my grandmother, I immediately kind of looked on the back, and it was like, <gasps> <laughs> I mean, there were threads hanging everywhere, and raw edge, and I was like, so I turned it back to the front and said, isn't it lovely? <laughs> and I thought, no, nope, not, not going there. But that was one of my things that my grandmother really, really grilled into us. That here's the front and here's the back. And it Like I have some cross stitch things. Here's the front of the cross stitch. Oh no. Okay. Fun. And then here's the back of the cross stitch. So we learned to carry the threads under and try to mask the fact that there was an end or that you were going to a different area and you don't carry for more than stitches. <laughs> yeah, a couple of stitches. Um, and this has no knots at all. This entire alphabet piece has no knots. So yeah, there are very few sewing things that actually have knots. Now this type of embroidery does have knots, but the knots are very little. And on the back, there are knots. And then, but then you, you really run, don't see the knots. And and after you do the knot, then you run the tail underneath some of the adjacent stitches so that the tail is not hanging it's around. It's not going to be a floppy thing where you'll notice where the knots are. Right. So, okay, now let's talk quilting. Yes. So why don't I move to the big camera? Okay. And we can see what she brought. So this is for in Margaret's house, <laughs> such as it is. Okay, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know everybody's names. The lady who's been working on the Christmas stocking? Betty. Betty. You will appreciate these then, Betty, because these are my holiday quilts. So this was one that I made when I... Oh, um, let me go turn it. So we can so we can tell, make sure we're in we're in frame. <laughs> make sure we're framing this right. For I day. was assigned jury duty one time years ago, and I thought I'm not going to sit here and wait to be called to a pool and have nothing to do. And so I took my applique pieces already drawn, closer, and I started appliqueing. And I did this piece first. And I was the only person in hundreds sitting in the room sewing that day. The next day, we had about 10 of us who were sewing. The next day, we had about 20 of us who were sewing. <laughs> They're all like, oh, that was such a good idea. <laughs> so this is my jury duty quilt. And so I finished the whole thing while I was sitting waiting to be called. And I was never called to an individual jury. But I got a lot of quilting done. <laughs> so that's all hand done. Hand pieced, hand quilted. 
this one is probably one of my most favorites. This is my Halloween quilt. It was supposed to be a little tiny wall hanging where you're supposed to cut these pieces out of um, iron on fabric and just iron them on. And I, I couldn't do that. So I picked the three that I really liked, the ghost and the little girl witch and the lion. And I blew them up big and then I added the other things. And I decided if you were gonna have something that said trick, you needed to have a trick. So I have my frog over here with his crown on and then it goes down to treat and you had to have a treat. So I have my candy corn. So I sometimes hang this one out on my front porch, but more often now I use it just as a throw on my sofa in the, the appropriate season. But it's, again, it's all hand pieced, hand quilted. I don't know if you can see the black on black, but it's all hand pieced and hand quilted because I thought all of quilting was hand done. I never knew you could do anything on a machine till 25 years ago when I joined this quilt guild. And the first thing they said for retreat was, now bring your sewing machine. Well, I had a knee controlled cabinet style sewing machine. I'm not bringing that to a retreat. So I had to go and buy a little, wasn't great. <laughs> and I I've never used it since, but a little sewing machine to take. And I could I mean, why do I need a sewing machine? We're going to be quilting. And they were, you can quilt on a machine. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so I learned to actually piece things on a sewing machine. And the very first class that I ever took, and I didn't bring that piece up, I should have, was I walked in and the lady hands us this little piece to make sunflower and it was paper piecing. And I had never seen paper piecing before because you do that on a sewing machine, not by hand. So after many years, I started doing more paper, whoop, paper piecing. And this is a piece that I did um, that's got the deer in the woods. I don't recommend this because the trees had to be paper pieced so they stayed upright. The flowers had to be paper piece, so they stayed upright. You don't want flowers and trees on their head or sideways. So it's not a beginner piece for paper piecing at all, but it was a lot of fun to do. And if you aren't familiar with paper piecing, it's papers that, are, that tell you what fabric to use where and when, and then you have to pull the paper off the back. And this is also one that is paper pieced. And it'll just be a little wall hanging. And again, most of the paper's off on the back, but there's still some you can see where the papers are still there. And then, Stack and wax, which I have sort of become known for in my guild. I've taught it a couple of times in our guild and other guilds. And um, I always like to take the original yeah, so fabric original. that I use so that people can see what, what you started with. And this is the fabric I started with. It was a Christmas print, uh, a nativity type print. And the words say good, goodwill to all, peace on earth, stuff like that. But it, then it's got the Holy Family and the shepherds and the angels and, and everything. And I often go to a quilt store and buy whatever fabric they have on their cheap table. <laughs> because you need a lot of yardage when you do stack and whack. You're going to take eight pieces of fabric exactly the same. So wherever your fabric repeat comes, you're gonna go right there. And um, you're gonna stack those up so the patterns are exactly the same. So that when you cut your pieces and then you put them together, you get these kaleidoscope effects. Well, on this one, I just laid it out, cut my strips, cut my pieces, and whatever happened, happened. 
Well, I started putting it together and discovered that somebody else was guiding my hand on this one because what happened was I got rings of angels. I got rings of baby Jesus. I got rings of sheep. I could not have planned it. Let's see which, oh, this is one of my favorites. This yellow one is the baby Jesus and the star shining down on him. But we've got rings that are just all the angels together. It was just amazing how it came out. Here's another one with the angels that says goodwill to all. So I don't know how much you can read of it, but it's, it's probably... I like best and put those on the front and the ones that are left over get stuck on the back. So it has sewing theme because it was going to be a quilting retreat. And so the fabric has scissors and tape measures and spools of thread and all kinds of fun sewing things. So that was my original fabric. And then this is how the quilt ended up. And I started getting too many of these with the tape measure going around. So I turned my fabric the other direction and that's where the ones that look more like spokes come in, is from the opposite direction of the fabric. So I made myself a twin bed quilt that only gets used for retreats. <laughs> so that's my retreat quilt. And then I did fussy cut the binding so that the binding is all- No, camera's here. Oh, camera's here, sorry. The binding is all spools of thread and it was fussy cut so that it would come around and be the spools of thread. So that's that one. Uh, what else do I have? Then also at our retreat, which is once a year, we often bring in national teachers and then we sometimes do classes taught by guild members. And this particular one was taught by one of our guild members and it sort of has a um, cathedral window look, but you piece it and then you turn these little edges back just enough so that it frames out the star shapes. So here, the, the center star, so to speak, is not pieced. This is one solid piece of material. The yellow is superimposed on top of it, and it's done in such a way that it has this sort of cathedral window look to it. And so on the back, you can see that the butterfly print was one solid piece of fabric and the rest is put on top of it. So it was kind of a new technique. And that's sort of what we try to do at retreat classes is present new techniques that maybe you knew or maybe you would always wanna learn and you may never use again, right. but it was fun to do. So that was a retreat class. Then this piece I brought down just because it's a good piece for a beginning quilter, or if you want to teach a child to quilt, you can do it from a coloring book, you can do it from anything. You put your muslin fabric on top of whatever picture you want, and you use a um, fine point Sharpie, and you draw in all the black lines like you're making a coloring book. And then you take Crayola crayons, and it has to be Crayola because they have a higher density of pigment than any other brand of crayon. And you can color in your areas. So these are all colored with crayons. Then you take a good old brown paper shopping 
bag if you still have them or any kind of brown paper that's kind of thick like that and you put it under and over your piece on your ironing board and then iron it because if you don't do that your crayon is going to color your ironing board so you want to put you want to protect bottom and top and when you iron it it sets the color into the fabric and all of those little lines that you made when you colored disappear because they melt together. So it looks like it's been painted. And then this is because it's a quilt, it still has a front, a back and batting in between. Then we just hand stitched around it to hold me up. There's not even any binding on it. So that's why it's a good beginner piece. There's no binding whatsoever. And then it was hand quilted just around the edges. So it was stitch in the ditch quilting at this point, at this point, and the edge. And we put little tabs on it so it could be hung. And that's it. So it's a great beginner piece, especially for children. And it can be something they drew themselves. It can be all kinds of things, whatever you want it to be. Um, 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 can I ask a question? Um, I, ju I just have a question about the drawing on the with the Crayola crayon. Do um, you what kind of material do you have to draw on for that to work? It's muslin. It's one hundred percent cotton muslin. Okay. And you can this one is unbleached muslin, so it's slightly off white. But okay. you can use white muslin as well. But you you need muslin because you want to be able to see through it to copy whatever drawing you're you're uh -huh. transferring. Okay. And then you want it 100% cotton because it's the best thing to hand quilt on. Okay. Thank you. If you have any other fiber in there, hand quilting is harder. Mm -hmm. Even if it's an 820 cotton Dacron, it's not going to be as easy to quilt as 100% cotton is. So. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. And it's a pretty, um, pretty fine grade muslin. You don't want to get a cheap muslin that's too open a weave. If you like go to Walmart or something, your weave is much more open. There, there are three grades of what they call gray goods. And that's the fabric, the raw fabric that's created in the mill. And um, the cheapest grade is what you see at Walmart and discount places. Then the middle grade is what you'll see at places like Joann's. And then the very good grade is what you'll see at quilt shops. And so you might see the same print at Walmart that you see at the quilt shop, but the fabric that was printed on is gonna be dramatically different. And if you learn to feel it, you, you'll learn very quickly to feel the difference in the quality of the grade goods that it was originally printed from. So that's how you tell that it's a good good material. So anyway, I, I was born in Pennsylvania and I have always found one that I really loved until, what, two summers ago. Yeah. We were at a cousin reunion in Pennsylvania and I found this coloring book that had a distal thing that I really liked. And so I bought the coloring book so that I could have the distal thing that I wanted. <laughs> and then I enlarged him. And I added all kinds of borders around. And then I hand applicated the entire thing. And when I had hip surgery a year ago, I, uh, I started in on this quilt. And it's all hand pieced. I designed it myself, except for the center distal thing that I took from the coloring book. But that's the quilt. And the borders go all the way around. So it's got the bright Pennsylvania Dutch colors, but it's a distal think I really liked. And this is a distal think. And every time you see the color change, that is a separate piece of fabric. All these silly little circles are individually hand turned pieces of fabric. It's called a crazy person's project. <laughs>
So this is applique. And on the back, you can see that it was all hand applique. And now I can't find anybody that wants to quilt it for me because I want to have it quilted on a machine. I don't want to have to try to hand applique, a hand quilt on top of all this applique. And nobody wants to tackle it. And everybody's like, oh, that's too good. I can't do it. And I'm like, oh. So I'm still looking for a quilter. But it'll get done someday. But I have one granddaughter. I have four grandsons, but I have one granddaughter. And when I showed it to her half done, she was like, Grandma, I love it. I said, okay, it'll be yours. She went, really? I said, uh-huh. She said, oh, well, after all, I am your only granddaughter. <laughs> so I know eventually where it will end up, but I'm going to get to use it for a little bit before she actually gets it. So what else you want to show? Uh, show me. Oh, oh, the well, dresses. Yeah, the dresses. That's right. So Margaret's specialty is making French sewing for yeah. children. Yeah, all this other is my fun stuff. But what I really love to do are You're children's cool. clothes. This was an antique christening dress, and I just finished repairing it. And all this lace was hanging, and the necklace was off. But it's like 125 years old. And it's made for a baby 125 years ago that if you didn't christen them when they were five, six pounds, they'd never fit in the dress. Well, today's babies are much bigger than that at birth. And so the lady brought it to me. She lives in Nashville, Tennessee, and said, could I make another one exactly like this? They were going to frame this one and uh, but make it bigger. They wanted to fit a nine month baby. Well, it has all these tucks at the bottom of the dress and the slip. So it took a lot of time. And this was just, like I said, just ragged. And I told her if she was gonna frame it, I could at least get it to look better. So I, I repaired this one, but then this is what I made to duplicate it. So she picked out the laces. We got them as close as we could to the original. It has all of the pleats on the dress and the slip. <laughs> but it's worked on Batiste, which is a very fine cotton. Um, fine as in that it's $32 a yard. But every pleat is done with a pulled thread from which you fold the pleat so that you're sure the pleats are folded exactly straight on every row before you sew them down. But that's the reproduction one. So now that they're done, I get to send them to her and they will be out of here. <laughs> so that'll be good. Right. She has repaired old things that are intended to be worn, but since this was not intended to be worn, she just kind of tacked things in place so that it would look good when it was framed. Yeah, I didn't want her to have taken to a framer and have him not get the laces where they sort of belonged, um, and then she'd get it back and go, oh, that would have been nice. Again. So I just said, look, let me put everything back kind of where it needed to be and then go from there. But around the house, there are all kinds of crazy things. Like I have pillows that are needle pointed where I'm at the middles. But it was a little piece and I thought, what am I gonna do with that little piece? So I made it into a pillow and then made two of them. <laughs> so what questions do you all have? And as you can tell, Margaret does just about every needle craft you can think of plus painting. So uh, any of yeah, your crafting questions, costume. have at it. <laughs> Ellen, it's great to have you with us today. Uh, what, kind of, what kind of work do you like to do? Uh, I, I, I'm not a serious crafter. I do a little of everything. 
a little needlepoint, a little, I just started, my sister's a real quilter and uh, she just been sending me, you know, scraps. So I started making pot holders, um, just playing, trying to learn, um, yeah. you know, little bits. She started me off. Um, I haven't done any applique. I just bought a kit to do needlepoint. Um, unfortunately, I bought a big kit. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm mostly interested in, um, I, w I want to follow directions from kits to develop a little skill, but I'm more interested in playing you know, different colors, different designs. I, when I was younger, I would draw designs and then try and embroider them on, you know, hippie clothes. So anyway, <laughs> that's, that's just my interest. I'm fascinated. I mean, with someone, I totally appreciate how many years and years of skill, you know, and training a really well, I mean, I, I would never show you the back of anything I've ever done. <laughs> really bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got good at making my backs look as good as my fronts because I got tired of taking things out. And uh -huh. every time I would bring my embroidery to my grandmother, she would say, well, now, honey, if you took this out and redid this section, it would look better. <laughs> so I go back and I take it out. And and there's nothing more boring than unsewing. Sure. And so I learned to not do those things wrong so that I didn't have to take them out and do them over. And so it's so automatic for me now that I don't even think about the back. It's right. just, it just happens. And then somebody will look at the back and they, oh my gosh. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. It does look okay. <laughs> because I seriously don't even think about it. And I do most of my sewing watching old movies, or mm -hmm. I have TV in my sewing room so that I can watch old movies on Turner Classic or videotapes or something um, that I, my hands, my, a lot of people are doodlers. I'm not a mm -hmm. doodler, I'm a needle worker. And so I can sit in meetings and things and work on my handwork um, as much as somebody else would sit there with their pen and paper and just doodle. I, I can knit. I can knit in a movie theater. <laughs> yeah, really. My way through college. In the dark. Yeah, we both knitted our way through college because uh, if you keep your hands busy, it, it also helps to focus your brain. Well, and if you went to one of those really boring, I, I'm an elementary education major, <laughs> and it, there's nothing more boring than el early elementary education courses, and especially professor is going to read you the book in a monotone. <laughs> and so at the end of the class, everybody's like, oh, that was the worst. I said, like, yeah, but look, I have a sweater. <laughs> <laughs> so it really wasn't that bad. Um, and because I've been limited in doing stairs, because I've had several surgeries recently, um, and my sewing room is downstairs, and I'm in a three-story house, I was limited to doing things that I could do sitting in the living room and so one of the things that I really had fun with this spring was smock Easter eggs. Oh, oh my God. So I went crazy with them. <laughs> and this is about half of them because my Easter eggs. daughter and my granddaughter. Is there an egg in here or this is styrofoam? Uh, styrofoam. There is a styrofoam egg. And then she smocked around it. So uh, I don't know if you've ever done smocking, but you start by gathering. On children's clothes, mainly. Children's clothes, yeah. You gather the fabric, and then you stitch, sort of an embroidery stitch. I can see if I can get close enough to the camera that you can tell it. But it's got embroidery yeah. stitches on it. This one's got a little little bunny on him, little chocolate Easter bunny. It was the predecessor of elastic in children's clothes because it, it's stretchy. And um, so they'll often do it these days as inserts in children's clothes. But we had, when we were little, we had matching dresses 
that um and so I would I would and being the younger sister, I got to wear both of them. That's right. And <laughs> if we had mother daughter dresses, I even got to wear mom's when I got older. <laughs> it's true. So but uh the the panels in the dresses we had would be like eight inches wide. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, the whole yoke of it would be paneled. Now usually if you see smocking on something, it's just a small strip, a decorative mm, strip. Well, I can, it depends Margaret on what makes, it is. Margaret makes smock dresses. This one is done over the old plastic legs eggs that you used to get the legs pantyhose that and they actually came in eggs. And I saved a lot of my eggs. So this one is actually done over a plastic egg that was that. And so I let my daughter and my granddaughter pick and they picked a lot of different ones. But they were just so much fun to do that I kind of got carried away and I did a whole slew of them and it became my Easter decoration this year because <laughs> I could do it sitting in the chair. <laughs> but they were fun. And do that's have, just another. Do you have a smock dress around handy? <laughs> um, I don't think I do. Okay. Yeah. She um, makes them for other people. Her her granddaughter. Couple downstairs. She made a deal with her daughter and her daughter-in-law. <laughs> That whoever had the first girl was going to have free dresses for 10, ten years. years. Mm -hmm. 10 yeah. years of free clothes. <laughs> and then I kept getting grandson, grandson, grandson. Finally, the last two, I got a girl and a boy. And my daughter's the one that had the girl. And she kept saying, Mom, what if Jesse has a girl first? I said, well, then Jesse gets 10 years of free clothes. But Jesse never had the girl. Uh, my daughter had the, the the only granddaughter. And so when she turned 11, my granddaughter came to me and she said, Grandma, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but maybe let's don't make any more smock dresses. <laughs> I'll wear what I can still wear, but maybe let's don't make any new ones. I said, honey, that's fine. I got you this old. Most people give up at seven at the most. And I said, and I know I'll get popular again when you need formal. So, <laughs> so, so now she, if, if she has me make something for her, she'll draw me a picture of what she wants and she'll identify what fabric she wants on it, what color it is. And then say, can you make this grandma? And I go, okay. And so then I make her that dress. So it's fun. I see Jewel has joined us. Hi, Jewel. Hi. Hi. Oh, I just got up. Uh, actually, Smocking. Michael. When I was in when I was in Europe, uh, they still have children's dresses that are smocked in Belgium and um, yeah, actually in Belgium and, and in France and, and um, a lot in Belgium because there were a lot of children uh, clothing. I mean clothing um, shops, but um, they had a couple of smocking dresses in um, at the London City Museum, and these were dresses that kids wore during World War II. And I had a couple of smock dresses, so did, so did my sisters. And I, had, I have two younger sisters. Yes, mom dressed us alike. We wore that nylon dress and I should have saved it because I was talking to a friend about it. And she also had two younger sisters. She said, yeah, we had the three nylon dresses too. I said, darn it, we should have saved that. Like, dress. I, in fact, looking through uh, all these old patterns, and my, my mother had dress patterns. I mean, I think my, they're still in my sister's place the, when we were, I don't know, six years old. Maybe, maybe, maybe um, I'll come across it. But um, big thing was the nylon dress. I don't know. You, well, you guys, I yeah. I was seeing pictures of how Kate, uh, Princess Kate, dresses the kids, and George and Charlotte will be in smocked clothes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because, just, yeah, in England. Yeah, they they still do that. That's very European. Well, and this is English smocking, and English oh. smocking is on the pleats, oh. whereas American smocking is done from dots and uses less fabric. And hardly anybody does American smocking anymore. But it came to this country because the um, they brought the skills of English smocking to America, but we didn't have the mills here in the old days that they had in England. So fabric was much harder to come by. And so they devised the system where if you buy a McCall's pattern or something, it'll have a sheet of just dots inside for you to transfer to the fabric. And then you pick up each dot and you smock it that way. And it takes much less fabric than English smock, about half as much fabric. So it's not nearly as full or nearly as pretty 
um, as English mocking. And so English mocking has now that fabric is readily available has become pretty much the norm. Uh, most people don't do American smocking anymore, but um, English mocking is still in the Southeast where I live is still very readily used in the North, not as much. And in the West, not as much, but in the Southeast, they still dress children often in these little smocked outfits, which is good for me because that's what I like to do. And so I have a lot of customers who request it, or maybe they make the smocking piece and then they have me put it together as a, an outfit. So yeah, it's fun. So you start by gathering the fabric and mm -hmm. you have a machine, as I recall, it's, that gathers it. It's a set of pleat of gears and you run the machine through and it pushes it onto needles and it pleats it up that way. And it's a, a, a pleater. And the first one I got was from South Africa. And um, we sent away for it. And three of us went together because we were poor. And um, we each paid $25 to have this thing sent from South Africa. It was $75. And I still have that one. But now you can buy them in the States. And they're about $120 to $150 to get a pleater. And it's a much smaller thing, but this one came big and it was mounted on a board and had a place for your spools of thread to feed into your needles. It was really cool. But the American, the ones you get now are just the gears and then you have to figure out what you're going to do with all your threads. Right. And we should hasten <laughs> to add that she paid $75 for it 50 years ago. Right? Yeah, that was back in, in the <laughs> early 70s. I paid $75 for it. Um, and then I would pleat for the other two girls that owned it because it was like, oh, let me just pleat it for you. It's easier. So it mostly stayed at my house. And then when they the kids got too big, I said, well, let me buy out your interest and I'll just keep it. And they were like, oh, no, you've pleaded plenty of things for us. Just keep it. So I got to keep it after I used it to plead everything. And I even pleaded for a shop. And <laughs> so it was it was a good investment that I made a lot of money with. <laughs> Any other questions that you'd like to raise? Well, Margaret, does your granddaughter, does she want to learn any of that needlework or is she interested at all? She is interested. She is a college student and they have very little time, but she does know how to knit. And mm -hmm. so she's made a few scarves and um, she knows the basics of cross stitch because she sees her mother doing cross stitch and her mother also knows how to knit a little bit. Um, they they can make scarves. They wow. don't really branch off too much yet on that, but they know the basics. And I'm hoping that the interest will be there still when they begin to have more time to do it. But with my daughter, it was always, why should I learn to do it, Mom? I just hand it to you, and you'll you'll do it. So it it almost like it skips generations sometimes. So I'm hoping my granddaughter is gonna be the one that's going to really pick it up and run with it as she gets a little older. We, we want it to happen in the generations before us, too. It was our great-grandmother who was the real needlework artist. Yeah. And then her daughters <clears throat> learned a little bit of embroidery. They did a nice job with embroidery and a lot of mending. My, gr <laughs> my grandmother had six children, so yeah. she had a lot of mending. Uh, and my mother learned more than that. But yeah. still not not anything like her grandmother did. Mom's work, um, and I don't mean this to be detrimental, but a lot of what mom did was more homemade clothes for us. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference in homemade and handmade. <laughs> and uh, handmade is a little bit more perfection than homemade. And Margaret and I learned to make our own dresses sort of out of self-defense. <laughs> to keep mom from making them. <laughs> the basics. And I'm so grateful for that. And, and for us, um, we learned it at a very young age because my great-grandmother was still living. Um, and she was born in the mid-1800s, 1865. And... Um, in her house, children were to be seen but not heard. And so to 
be in the room with the ladies when they started telling these wonderful stories of how things used to be. The only way you could listen to those stories is if you could be quiet. Well, Joyce probably could be a lot more quiet than I could because it was very hard for me to sit still and be quiet unless my hands were busy. And so we were taught very early to sit and do embroidery so that we could sit quietly in the room and listen to these great stories. And so we were like four, five when we yeah. started. And by the time I was in the fourth grade, I had crocheted a granny square afghan. And we were making our own dresses and skirts that we wore to school. I had a whole catalog for her Madame Alexander doll of clothes <laughs> I was willing to make for her doll. <laughs> so, you know, it just it started very young and it, it's just worked into a lot of other things. But I have a hard time zeroing in on what type of sewing I want to do. I, I do all different types of sewing. And I had a friend who had a needle workshop and she would call and she'd say, I've got three people that are interested in learning Brazilian embroidery. Can you teach that? Okay. I, I've got people that want to learn how to tap. Will you teach that? Yeah, I'll teach it. You know, and so whatever Julie had, enough, if she'd get a few people together for a class, then I would just go and teach whatever she needed in her needle workshop. And so that was, that was fun. And it was a way to keep polishing my skills. And so it's just, it's kind of grown into a lot of different needlework interests for me. So I can't figure it's, out one it's, thing it's, I like. It's, it's good to know that you're still willing to, to learn because you go to retreats and you're still taking classes and, and, and not just learning, you're, t you're teaching others. So, um, you know, kudos, kudos to you for, you know. Well, you're both very a, talented. Well, thank you. Whenever you take a class, you'll always learn something. Yeah. And I mean, I took a class one time and the lady said, if you were stranded on a desert island, name three projects you would want to have with you. I just panicked. And she was like, what? And I said, I can't even think of three kinds of sewing that I could limit it to. So she said, well, start and just make a list of what you do. And she stopped me at about 23 different types of things that I did with my hands. And she said, I see where your problem is. And she said, why are you here? I said, because you always learn something in a class. Oh, sure. I, I took a class from a lady named Sarah Stone, who is the guru of hand sewing um, for children's clothes in the United States. She brought all of this fine handwork here that's now a lot done on machine, but everything she did was by hand. And an old technique to attach laces to fabric was called rolling and whipping. And you can only do it on hundred percent cotton fabric and you roll the edge of the fabric and then you whip it to the edges of the lace and you build the lace inserts that way. And I had been doing my own technique <laughs> of it sort of learned from books. And I took a class from Sarah Stone and she had seen my work and she was like, what on earth are you doing in this class? And I said, Sarah, there's got to be an easier way to roll and whip than I do. And I'm taking the class to learn that from you. And I said, that's the only reason I'm in here. And she said, well, heck, I can show you how to do that. And so she said, where's your fabric in the area? So I handed her all this stuff and she goes like this. And she licked her fingers to roll the fabric. And I told her, I said, not a single book I looked at does it say to spit on your fabric first. <laughs> But it was the trick that made it instantly roll so that you could do a, a nice roll and whip. And I said, that was worth the whole price of the class right there. <laughs> so you always learn some little trick. I learned that if you prick your finger and you bleed on your fabric, suck on it without lipstick, suck on the fabric, and it will take your blood out of your fabric. You can't do it for somebody else. But it, chemically, your saliva will take your blood out of the fabric. So when I'm working on these fine fabrics that are $32 a yard, and I actually bleed on one, I just suck on it, and the blood will come out. 
So, you know, you just look for those little tricks that you're going to learn at classes because there's always some little secret that somebody will give you and it makes taking the class worthwhile. And it's just fun to be with a lot of other people who are as crazy about sewing as you are. So, I want to thank um, you. I have to go, but this has been fabulous. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, out. That'd be great. <laughs> Yeah, I have to go. This is very really interesting. And um, your quilts with the template, you know, your your art quilts. It's very interesting. I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, the one that you haven't uh, was it the Pennsylvania one for your granddaughter? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, work of art. Yeah, it's, it's like a quilt show. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Right. Thanks, too. You'll have to give Joyce, a, get her to take a picture of your Christmas stocking when you have it all together. I'll, I'll bring it next week. It, and I prefer to crochet because crocheting, you just need the yarn and you need a hook and you can do it in front of the TV. So, uh, so, so sewing, keep, you know, has kept me busy, but um yeah, if I if I had to choose like three things that I needed to you know take with me to to keep busy, it'll probably be crocheting it. and um, it, you know it was like doing the stockings. It was like I have my bag of sequins. I have all my different color threads. Okay. I have different. I have the skinny skinny needles for the sequins and a little bit fatter ones for you know my appliques. So. But crocheting would be my first passion. But, but I've learned a lot from from Joyce also, but I kind of went backwards. I started, um, well, I'll skip the hot mats, but she gave me the stack and whack. And <laughs> so I, I started with the stack and whack. And then I, and then Joyce started showing us, um, was that she she showed us by jello and I says, oh no, that's that's a little too confusing. So she showed us the rail stop. So I, I said, so I, I said, you know what, I can do the rail stop. And then the last the last projects that she showed us was um, was it called three yards? You can make, you know, a quilt. And she gives me all these patterns for a pretty darn quick. <laughs> So we, so we went from hard to middle to to pretty darn quick and moving forward it's going to be pretty darn quick. <laughs> so. See now everything is easy because you started with the hard stuff so it's all easy now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it that's tr that that's true. It's 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 all easy and it's gotten easy. So but I I think at this you know I, I I'm also willing you know to learn and pick, you know, and pick up shortcuts. And so I'm, I'm having fun. Well, I'm, you know what, I'm glad you shared. I'm, I'm glad we had this opportunity to, you know, to meet and, you know, get some ideas. So not that I would do any of that stuff. So, but. Um, you got to be yeah. a certain amount of crazy to do some of this stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I thought I was kind of crazy when, um, the stocking that I made for my niece's uh, soon to be newborn, it was when I opened up the package, it had over 160 pieces. I'm going, oh my God. It, because you don't know, you only get, you only get a, you know, you're in a catalog, you only see a picture that's only like this big, but it doesn't give you a description like, you know, how, how many pieces. And this, so it had over 160 pieces to it. So, but at least with this one, it only has a hundred. So, um, so it's oh, doable. And, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And people ask me, it was like, um, how long, do, you know, does it take you, you know, to do a stocking? So the last, um, last year that I did for my nieces, my niece had, uh, my niece out in Wisconsin, she had three kids. So I kept track of the hours. So if they asked me, I know how long, you know, it took, but but you can't you can't you can't put value in the hours you know that you you know put into it. So, but it, for someone that doesn't you know do needlework, um, 
they you know they just don't understand and and so, and so they they want to know but you know so they, that's the they have concept of the time that went into it uh and like with the dresses that i make there's no way i could charge by the hour i just have to set a price that's comfortable for me and still within the market limits um because I know there's no way you could figure how many hours actually go into it. And I rarely am doing some one piece from start to finish. I usually have multiple things going, but because I've been limited in where I can go in the house because of the, all the stairs, I know that this I started two weeks ago, Sunday, and it's almost done. Where normally. Wow. Never Is have that done a windmill? A in two a weeks. Yeah. It's just going to be a little table piece. Oh, that's nice. But, you know, normally I, I have things that I work on forever because it's not the finished item for me as much as it is the process of, of enjoying working on it. So I'll work on a lot of different things at the same time, usually. Joyce flies right through them. Joyce says, so work. Work. So, so. And Betty, how many crocheted blankets have you made now in the last couple of months? Um, you know what? This since uh, since I found out about um, help our kids back in February, I was just finishing up um, one for um, the welcome blanket. But but since February. I've done eight for, you know, help our kids. But if I constantly work on one because it ends up being like a 40 by 40, um, I can do, I can do one in, in two weeks. So yeah. as far as, as, yeah, as far as the number of hours, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't total, you know, those. So, but crochet, crocheting is quicker than, than knitting. So, uh, depends I, on what you're making. I can't see that. <laughs> it's a shawl. It's a shawl. Oh, that's pretty. <sighs> Very nice. What and color that is, is that? that? Looks kind of like like rust what color is that? It's a rust color. Can you Red? see the pretty rust? Oh, rust. rust. Oh, it's pretty. Sort of Pink uh, and then it has uh, oh here's a knitted design here, a little bit like an Icelandic pattern in this dark area. I don't know if you can see it from the pattern. Yes, I, can, I can see it. That's pretty that's, that's what it's gonna end up looking like. <laughs> Beautiful. Eventually, someday. But I haven't worked on it in a long time. But it just, so, you know, if you talk about when did you start it and when did you finish it, uh, it'll be a while. <laughs> yeah. But some days I feel like knitting and so then I pull it out. And some days I feel like cross stitching and I pull it out. Sort of whatever you want to work on. Oh, so her husband brought over this shadow box. You want to show them the shadow um, box? Then I'm a member of a dollhouse miniatures group. And this is wow. just one of the That's gorgeous. Very pretty. It's just just different things, different times. That may, you never know what you're going to get into. <laughs> then I have my painting that's around the house in different places and a lot of different stuff. But I enjoy it all. Good. So good. Uh, so I think we're going to have lunch with my brother, with our brother, and yes. uh, so we'll probably sign off about now. Okay. Thank All right. So, yeah, I I enjoyed this. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank yeah. you. Uh, when you be today. back next week, Joyce? When are you back yeah. in town? I'm back next week. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Enjoy the rest of your time visiting. Have fun. So. Have fun. All right. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.